Welcome to Reconnect, the podcast dedicated to sharing and defending the good news of Jesus Christ. All religions except Christianity require mankind to work to overcome our greatest problem. It is in Christianity alone that we have divine redemption through the person and work of Jesus of Nazareth, who through his life, death, and resurrection defeated sin, death, and the devil forever. Reconnect us, O Lord. All right, listeners, this is episode 31 of Reconnect. Uh, This episode, I have guest Jake Wells with me. Uh, I met Jake because he first sponsored a Kickstarter project that I had. uh, And from that, I actually got to meet him in person because Kickstarter revealed to me that he lived in my wife's hometown, Big Bear. So one of the trips up there, I got to meet him and uh, we've kicked it off pretty well. I've been really inspired and encouraged by the way I see Jake sharing the gospel through his many passions that he has. He's a tattoo artist. He is a remote control helicopter enthusiast, so he builds his own remote control helicopters. And as well as he's he's really talented in many different areas as well, like uh, with making apps for phones and things. And, and, and all these different gifts and talents he has, he is uh, using them to the glory of God. And so I hope with this episode, as I talk with Jake, just that you would be inspired, listener, to think about what gifts you have, what talents you have, and if you could do something similar like what Jake is with them uh, online or creating some specific ministry where you can bless people with the uh, the gifts that God has blessed you with. So, Jake, thanks for being on this show. Uh, and thanks now, for having me. And uh, you're sitting in your car, huh? <laughs> yeah. That's cool. Yeah, That's maybe the have... first interview where someone's in their car. I have uh, four kids inside, and they're driving my wife crazy. So I have from ten months on to eight years old. So they're all going crazy in there. Yeah, well, uh, you know, thanks for taking the time. Yeah, definitely. So, uh, as as I shared, you're a tattoo artist as well as really big into remote control helicopters. Most most people call those drones. So. Uh, maybe before we get into those, both of those talents you have and how you're sharing Christ through them, just first touch on how Christ came to you, how you were saved. Uh, just <laughs> long story. <laughs> all my, all my life. Yeah, it's a long story. Um, I'll try to shorten it up, but all my life, the Lord was knocking on my door and all my life till I was about 30. I slammed the door on him as much as I could. So, uh, he never gave up on me, which is cool. Mm-hmm. But, uh, one, I was tattooing him for about eight years, and everybody that I had tattooed pretty much had a sad story. They, uh, they, their mom had cancer, died from cancer, they had cancer, um, Somebody was murdered, somebody ran over by a car, just sickness and death and just sadness all over the place every day, all day long. So one day I was sitting in my garage drinking by myself, and about midnight, one in the morning, and I said, you know what, God, you're real, why does this place suck? Why don't you do something about it? And, uh... I got up and went to go inside to go to bed, and I heard a voice in my head say, it was not like an audible voice or a different voice. It was like a thought in my head that said, I shouldn't have done that. Mm. And I I stopped, and I was like, what the heck was... Okay, so the next day I kind of like would have thoughts, and then the TV would say something that I was thinking, it started kind of weirding me out. And, uh, I dealt with that kind of stuff of hearing voices and, uh, a lot of it was guilt. Mm. You're, 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 you're a horrible person. You did this and you did that. And, and then finally it was, I'm God and you, you know, you've sinned for the last time. You need to do this for me to forgive you. Hmm. And, uh, I would do whatever they told me to do. 
give money to somebody or or pick something up or pick up trash or um, uh, pick up cigarette butts on the side of the road or you know just all this works and stuff like that and it finally went to the point where um, I would start to refuse to to do what the voice was telling me to do and um, as you guys thought it says you know if you don't do this then I'm gonna kill your kids wow and so it got really bad to the to the point where I like well I'm just gonna kill myself I can't I can't I can't please you everything I do you know you tell me to to do something and I do it and then there's no forgiveness there mm. so you're a liar you know basically and you know it was, uh, one night I just had had enough and, uh, the voice basically told me that my wife was the problem and to, to leave her and kick her out and that my, my, uh, pretty much just everything was everybody else's fault and my fault and to get rid of it all. So I, Actually, it started to think that somebody was playing a trick on me mm-hmm. <laughs> because I would have a thought and then say a homeless person would come up to me and tell me exactly what mm. Or I'd have a thought that if I didn't do something, uh, my, my kid was going to die and I'd refuse to do it. And then my wife would call me and say, you know, um, saw one just fell down and hit his head for no reason. And I'd freak out, you know. Uh, yeah. Quite fine, but I'll do it. So... Uh, one day I was just fed up and I ended up going uh, off and the police showed up and they told me to sit on the curb and I sat down and they're like, I don't know, we got reports that he's just out on the street yelling and stuff. The cop came up to me and leaned down to put handcuffs on me and I freaked out started wrestling them. They took me to jail and they let me go the next morning. And then, uh, they, or I just walked around all day that day and I, and I kept having thoughts like, well, you didn't do what I said. So last night I killed your family. Wow. And so that night I ended up trying to kill myself and, uh, Um, <clears throat> I ended up to where I, the only thing I could find was a trash bag. And so I would try to suffocate myself and I'd wake up and I'd hear my wife's voice going, you know, you, you, you're horrible at this. Like you got us killed. And, like you can't even do that right. So I try it again and try it again and try it again. I tried it like five times and I finally just got up and I had a plastic bag around my neck and, I had beaten up my my uh, arms and hands pretty bad because uh, the voice the voice that was claiming to be God had told me you know you tattooed all these people and they're going to hell to you you know you should break your hands you should break your arms so I tried to and couldn't do that dang so I ended up in the middle of the street again yelling for help just yelling for somebody to help me. And I ended up walking down. A few cars were just going around me. Nobody was stopping. And this was in uh, um, northern, like, North Escondido area. I So I walked down to this 7-Eleven. I was standing there. I didn't have a cell phone anymore because the voice had told me to throw my cell phone away, and I did. And I didn't have any money. And I was standing there with bloody arms and trash bag around my neck and this cop pulls up, and I'm like, oh, boy, here I go again. I'm going to go to jail. And he says, hey, how are you doing? I'm like, um, okay. Of course, I'm not doing okay. But he mm-hmm. said, you know what? Let me buy you a cup of coffee. I said, okay. He's like, you want a cup of coffee? I said, yeah. So he went inside and brought me a cup of coffee, brought it out. <laughs> and uh, I didn't know. Romans 13, I didn't know anything about the Bible. I didn't know that all authorities were placed here by God. Yeah. And, and uh, he 
came out and he's like, you, you know, you need to make a phone call. I said, um, yeah. He said, you get in my car. He didn't put handcuffs on me. Didn't, you know, just put in the back of the car with my cup of coffee. Didn't tell me to take the trash bag off or anything. He took me out, you know, down the street. I don't even know where it was to this payphone. Hmm. Yeah, you know, this is 2010, so I, have, I don't really know when all the pay phones went away, but I thought that they were all gone by then. Yeah, thought they were gives too. Gives me a stack of quarters, and I called my wife first, you know, and she answered the phone, and I said, "You're alive," and she said, "Yeah, and you're crazy." Mm. I said, "I don't care what you think, you're alive." So I, she hung up on me, and I looked at the sign because I was like look I would look at uh, license plates I'd look at signs I'd look for anything numbers anything to what do you want me to do God like what mm. do you want me to be doing right now you know yeah and I saw a sign that said uh, ER only it was emergency lane only or emergency parking only or something but all I saw was ER only so I turned to the stop and the name was Alexander uh. I said uh uh, just take me to the hospital. He's like, okay. They put me in the car and he took me to Palomar Hospital and they put me in the psych ward and things got pretty crazy, but I started hearing a voice say, you need to read the Bible. I'm like, I'm not reading the Bible. It's written by man. It's ridiculous. Like every time I ever try to read it, it doesn't make sense. You know, the beginning is full of brothers and sisters and all kinds of crazy stuff. I can't get past that part. Mm -hmm. So, you know, things would get really bad because I'm in a psych ward. And then things would get weird and then I'd hear this voice again. Man, what am I going to do? And I would... I finally, I said, you know what? I'm going to read the Bible. And the nurse came in and she said, all right, we're going to let you go now. Mm. Like, oh, I'm reading the Bible. Where, give me a Bible. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, long story short, I went home. I had this Bible, this King James Bible from, uh, my dad gave it to me and he had it in Vietnam. So he had made some notes on the sides and stuff. And, uh, I didn't understand any of it. Just the only thing I got out of it was you're a horrible person and you gotta die. Mm hmm. So when I heard this other, I heard another thought, you know, you need to go to church. I'm like, okay. But I had what was pretty much classified as OCD, where I couldn't go outside because I heard a voice say, put your gloves, yeah, put your gloves on. If I didn't have a hat on, I felt like someone grabbing my head. Um, if I saw a red car, I'd have to stop. If I saw a blue car, I'd have to turn right and be walking right. If I saw all these rules I had to follow. So it took me a good 45 minutes to walk a block to a, to a Baptist church. Mm. That was just, you could see it from my front door. Yeah. So I got there and it was closed. And I was like, they're not ever closed in the movies. There's always a guy there with a white collar thing. And, <laughs> you know, it sucks. So, <clears throat> I walked all the way back home, waited till Sunday, and uh, the house that I was staying in, everybody had moved out while I was in the hospital. Mm. And I still had two weeks left on my rent, so I just lived in there, and it was like this little pool house. So it was basically like a trailer. So I kept trying to read this Bible, and I read these notes from my dad, and just nothing really made sense. I didn't know where to start, where to read, where, you know. I would open it and try reading, then didn't, I didn't get it. So Sunday came, I walked into this church, I get there, and uh, the guy goes, his name was Maynard, and his wife's name was Martha, and I, he said, Maynard, and I was like, oh, that's cool, that's cool, pretty cool. Band, yeah, the you know? tool singer. <laughs> <laughs> He's an angry guy, but, you know, that was the first thought I had, so... Mm. He said, what are, you, what are you doing here? And I said, uh, I think God's mad at me. Huh. 
and uh, sorry. <clears throat> and he says, no. Nah. Wow. <clears throat> then he says, uh, sorry. He says, God's not mad at you. I said, well, I'm pretty sure he is, because for the past two years, you know, what I've been going through. And he said, no, um, give me a, a book of John. And um, he asked if he could pray for me, pray for me. And uh, I, he said, you know Jesus died for you, right? And I said, uh, yeah, I mean, you always hear that all your life, you know? Yeah. But I just said, yeah, to him. Uh-huh. I, I don't know why, I don't know why he died. I don't know what magical spell that breaks or what, you know, what, why is somebody having to die for me on the cross however many years ago then? What does that do for me? I don't get it. Mm-hmm. Well, of course, I didn't ask him any of that. So again, his book's John. I sat through the service and the band was horrible. And that's all I could think about was why why aren't they in tune? And I didn't hear anything that the pastor said. And I went home and opened this book of John after I did all my north, south, east, and west balancing thing because with all the spiritual stuff happening, obviously God was real. Yeah. So who's God? Yeah, yeah. So my, so my, you know, I figure, well, it's got to be Eastern gold, you know, they, they're the oldest around, you know, documented stuff. So I'll start studying Buddhism and Hinduism and that stuff and kind of mishmash it all together. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, so I had to balance the house because if I didn't balance the house, like everything, it's just totally messed up. Mm. So I, and I couldn't go in the living room area because I felt like I was getting sucked through the floor. Really scary. And then, so I had to sit and sleep in the kitchen. And I had stopped eating by this time, and I was only drinking water out of the faucet. And uh, I started reading this book of John, and I'd seen this guy, you know, Jesus, just doing all this incredibly nice stuff for people. And <clears throat> healing the sick and forgiving people and, you know, like what the heck? You know, who's this guy? Mm-hmm. And I get to, I get to John fourteen six and it says, "I'm the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father except for me." Yeah. And I said, "Well, if you're the only way to God, and I've never ever talked to God, so who's this fool I've been talking to?" Yeah, yeah. And that's when it all clicked for me. And I was like, "You're real." Hmm. And so I got saved right there. Wow, amazing. By myself and gave my life to the Lord. And uh, <clears throat> voice has stopped. Yeah. That's and, awesome. Yeah. Uh, like, whoa. And I just danced around, danced around the pool outside. It was pretty, it was amazing. Wow. And uh, <clears throat> the next day, I walked outside and I heard a voice say, I'm going to kill you now. And I said, go ahead. <laughs> mm. I'm not scared of you now, you know? Yeah. Then I went to work and um, started telling people that I, you know, got saved and I believe in Jesus. And they all, everybody treated me okay before, but now they really were like, oh, you're crazy. Mm. Jesus, that's that's nuts. You know, yeah. you're a Christian now, that's crazy. And this was at a tattoo parlor? Yeah, yeah. So is that something that you found, like uh, being a Christian in the tattoo world then is really challenging? Like, is it very um, accepted? There's a, lot, there's a lot of pain and confusion about who God is and who Jesus is in the tattoo world. Mm-hmm. Um, lots of rules that people... Christians like to implement and say, oh, you can't get a tattoo. Oh, uh, mm. you, you can't do tattoos. You're going to hell with that stuff. And I was like, um, no, you probably should read your Bible. Yeah. You know, and find out. And, 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 you know, that's 
part of the 613 commandments given to the Israelites. Do you follow the, all those? Mm-hmm. Um, do you throw away Jesus and just say, I'm going to follow and be perfect and follow everything? And they just think, well, it's written in the Bible, so that means I have to do that. Yeah. They're not following the story of everything that Israelites went through. Yeah, definitely. There's ceremonial law, and then there's moral law, and then there were laws given to the government of Israel. And so, like, ceremonial law, yeah, like, that's what Paul's talking about a lot in the New Testament, about you don't need to circumcise anymore. And if you say you must circumcise, then, like you're saying, you have to follow all those laws. And so you would say that the tattooing law, the, the law not to mark yourself, uh, that would fall that's, into that type yeah, that's of law where, where pulls out. yeah, Leviticus nineteen twenty eight, I believe. Mm-hmm. It says, "Do not cut yourself or mark yourself for the dead." Mm. And back then, people, when somebody died, they'd cut themselves and mourn and mark themselves up for false gods and all kinds of stuff. Yeah, well, that's a uh, that's a really th- powerful testimony that you just shared. Uh, I, this is you were speaking as someone who knows God's word. I could just see again and again, like all the points where what you were hearing was a was a direct lie. And then I'm sure now right. that you know the word of God, you're like, yeah, that's a lie. God, God wouldn't tell me to divorce my wife. God hates divorce. Right. In Malachi two sixteen, he says, I despise divorce. So if you ever hear like wisdom saying God wants you to get a divorce, it's like, well, no, God wants you to reconcile. God wants you to get right. at peace with your wife. So, I mean, and obviously er, everything throughout that story you were sharing of what you were hearing uh, was against God's word. So really powerful. Now now that you know the truth, um, how, how, how did that change just the way you approached life and uh, your job with tattooing? Well, I, I quit tattooing because I didn't know the Bible. And I kept reading... You know, to give everything up. Hmm. You know, that's what I was getting out of the Bible. Just get a, get, give everything up and the Lord will provide for you. Hmm. I'm like, oh, okay. You know, I, I gotta, I'll stop doing this. I'll stop doing that. I'll stop doing this. Um, anything that I enjoy, stop doing it, you know? Hmm. And uh, I was reading, I was, I would go, and pray for people, and, and like, I went to Santa Monica and saw some homeless people, and uh, they are all standing in line, and this church was giving out food, so I told pick out the Bible and just started reading it. You know, I didn't preach to anybody, I just started reading the Bible. I would do things like that, and I was just having a really good time with the Lord, mm-hmm. uh, watching things happen, and I was sitting, I was living in... Um, my ex-wife's, uh, my first wife from my first marriage, I've been married twice, so mm. her brother had been saved 18 months prior. Okay. And he had came to the tattoo shop before all this stuff happened to me, and I was just like, oh, it's cool, that works for you, man, you know, you're yeah. saved, that's cool. Well, after I got saved, I called him up and he let me live in his garage. Mm. So I was living in my garage, and my kids were living in Temecula with, with her, and she was living with her mom. And I get to First Corinthians chapter 7, it says, if you've been bound to a woman, do not seek to be loosed. Mm. And I was like, oh, wait, you don't want me to get divorced? Mm. And I'm like, okay. Yeah, but she's never going to get saved. Like, she'll never fall, you know? And... um showed up one day with a pin on my hat that said, I love Jesus. And she slammed the door in my face and she's like, oh, that's your crutch now. Da, 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 da. Well, long story short, I we started hanging out more and more and she'd say, well, let's go do this tonight. And I said, oh, the Bible says that not to do that kind of stuff. So mm. I'm not going to go do that. And she's like, oh, okay, fine. And I would hold her hand or, or just be around her and just pray as much as I could for her. And uh, one day she said, I want to go to church with you. Uh, I, I 
just pray, you know, Lord, save her. Wow. <clears throat> and uh, went to church with her, and we were like, yeah, we like this church. You know, typical, you know, struggle that everybody goes through when they go to church. You hear Satan telling you, you don't like it here. Don't go here. Look at that guy. They're judging you. Or mm. look at that. So everybody listens to those voices, and then they don't go to church anymore. Or they go to a different church. So we were going through that. And we ended up going to uh, a place called The Springs down in Schmecula. And real cool, real cool pastor. Uh, just a really nice congregation. And... Um, the, we're sitting in church and I saw our number come up for our kids being bad. So I went in there and they were crying and I sat with the kids and my wife stayed in the, in the service. Uh huh. And she came out or the service ended and came out and she was crying and coming down the hall. What happened? And she said, I don't know. I think I just got saved. <laughs> That's good. And uh, she's way, way stronger of a Christian than I am. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> really good. Pretty cool. That's awesome. Good, good stuff. All right. Well, Jake, we're gonna go ahead and take a break here, uh, and when we okay. come back for the second segment, uh, we'll we'll just dig into really how from here, after you've been saved, after your wife's been saved. Uh, how you begin to move back into tattooing and even you seeing this passion or finding this hobby of you seeing remote control helicopters and making them uh, to share your testimony. And listener, uh, if you go to fleshpilot.com, uh, it's Jake's site. He actually has his testimony written there that you can read it. Uh, there may be more details there than what he just shared. Uh, so please go to fleshpilot.com, check that out. And he also has another site called Black Arm Workshop. Uh, black, uh, no, it's, uh, blackarmworkshop.com, which I guess is also will work for props.com, right? Yeah. So, yeah, so th- those are sites. I'll have them linked to this episode. I uh, definitely want you to see his work online, uh, so you can get some visuals of what he's doing as we, uh, talk, uh, second segment then about how he's sharing Christ through his work. But I, ha- I have a feeling or I hope that people are gracious enough where we can dialogue about this, discuss this, and ultimately go to the scriptures and see what God says about this issue and just chat about it. Because I think it's one that's the most inter- misunderstood in today's society, and it's the issue of tattoos, okay? Now, obviously, you know what team I'm on, you know, I got some ink, um, but I prayerfully studied and pursued truth in that matter before I got these. These weren't whimsical. These weren't just on a whim. I did them on purpose and with intentionality. Now, tattoos, where do I start? So, a lot of times people will message on my videos. The classic disagreement with tattoos is in Leviticus. Now, I'll just read that verse real quick and we'll chat about it. So, this is the only verse that pretty much people can go to in the Old Testament that talks about tattoos. And it says this. It says, out of context, it says in verse... Uh, Leviticus 19 verse 28 you shall not make any cuts on your body for the dead or tattoo yourselves for I am the Lord now you read that out of context you're like oh brutal missed it right missed it but in context which is so important when you're reading the scriptures it's a little different it's a little different because in the entire chapter God in this passage is giving a bunch of statutes and kind of ways and how he lined up the Israelites to live at that point in time and let's read some more because a lot of people will quote this verse to me and if the people quote this to me then I would hope they also live up to the rest because that if they're going to live up to that then why not the other ones in the passage as well right and so just a few verses above it it says you shall not eat any flesh with blood in it And when you come into the land and plant any kind of tree for food, then you shall regard its fruit as forbidden. Three years it shall be forbidden to you and it must not be eaten. And then the fourth year you can eat it. And so a few things there is if you're the person quoting to me that I can't get tattoos, then you hopefully also are the person not eating any fruit or vegetable that has not been cultivated for at least three years. And on top of that, you don't eat any meat. Because all meat has some form of either dried blood or if it's medium rare, totally normal blood in the meat. And so just from a contextual standpoint, we have to say, okay, 
Well, obviously we still do those things, but why? Because in this passage, when you push into the scriptures and you kind of just study the context of this history and this time, you see it was meant for a time and a place. I mean, think about those other passages. Obviously we do those things and we cultivate and we eat fruit earlier and we eat medium rare steak. But God gave that to the Israelites as a wisdom issue. They didn't have pesticides. They didn't have refrigerators. And so he's looking at them and he's saying, he's saying, I'm looking out for your joy and your vitality. And this is how I want things to operate just so that you live right. And historically, if you look at their track record, they were one of the healthiest nations around because of that, because God had given them a few wisdom nuggets per se of how he made the world to line up. And then again, when you take that in context, And look at the tattoo verse, you also realize you can't mark up your body. So anyone that has has earrings, I always think that's funny when they're critiquing me about tattoos. Same thing, same verse. But on top of that, when you push a little deeper, the reason they say that is because it says you shall not make any cuts on your body for the dead or tattoo yourselves. Now the biggest thing there is when you study pagan worship from this time, pagan idolatry, and there was a, a source of pagan idolatry that said they would cut themselves and tattoo themselves literally as worship to dead people. They would honor and worship dead people as gods by cutting themselves and bleeding out and tattooing themselves. Now, God said that because he didn't want them to be aligned with that culture and he didn't want them to give off the wrong signal, right? Because if that was what tattoos were known as, then when they got one, people would think they were worshiping pagan gods. But in our culture, when you see someone with a tattoo, you don't instantly think they worship dead people, right? It's not like Sixth Sense and Bruce Willis. That'd be really awkward and weird. Some people might do it, but tattoos on a whole, you don't look at like that and say, that's why. And so... It's a wisdom issue. It's not a sin issue. It's a wisdom issue. And what I mean by that is if I have, you know, kids, hopefully Lord willing, way down the line. And if it's a daughter, no tattoos, just joking. But um, if the daughter or the son want to get tattoos, I'm going to ask them why. I'm going to ask them what of. And if they just say because it looks cool, because I want to be the next, you know, like young Jeezy, probably not. Because that's when they're 60 years old, those tats aren't going to be looking that good. But my tattoos, just for example, this one says forgiven, and this one says loved in the original Greek. And so when I'm 85 years old, I'm still going to want to know that I'm forgiven and still going to want to know that I'm loved. And so I just want to say, man, if we're going to really address this issue, can we just address it with right hermeneutic, right contextualization, reading it correctly? And a lot of people say, well, yeah, that's not the only verse. You know, in 1 Corinthians, it says that, you know, our body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. And so, you know, we don't want to mark it up. Now, yes and amen, but that verse, when you look at it again in its context, is specifically talking about sexual immorality. God says when you join yourself to another person in sexual immorality, because we're temples internally of the Holy Spirit, you're defaming and kind of like putting graffiti all over that temple and not respecting respecting it or honoring it. So it's not even talking about external. It's talking about how sexual sin is one of the most unique sins because it's internal and more spiritual. And then it's talking about how the issue is internal in general. And so lastly, I'll also just say, you know, we also can even have a little sense of humor when you look in Revelation 19. It says that Jesus will come back and on his thigh, word for word, it says on his thigh will say, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now, there's no footnote that says dry erase marker or with pencil. So, I mean, maybe Jesus even had a tattoo. I mean, how else is it, right? What else could it be if it's stamped on his thigh? Now, some of you watching are probably saying, hey, that's a stretch. And I say, yes and amen, that's a stretch. But it's just as much a stretch, if not even less so, than the stretch you try to make in Leviticus and 1 Corinthians. So I just say, hey, can we just turn this issue to the heart? Can we understand in context what those verses mean? And can we say that it's all about giving glory to God, whether that's in art, whether that's in tattoos, whether that's in piano, music, politics? It's all about using whatever we have to point to Him. And if that's happening, can we just live in community? Can we just have love and grace and forgiveness with one another and just represent him faithfully? To financially support Reconnect, visit ContradictMovement.org and order your copy of Contradict, They Can't All Be True. Contradict stickers and tracks are also available. Again, that's ContradictMovement.org. All right, welcome back, listener. Uh, uh, as I was talking uh, to Jake, the first segment, it dawned on me uh, during the break uh, 
I'm gonna out. I was, well, you've already listened to it because you're you're hearing it. But uh, I was I'm, I, I spliced in an audio of uh, a, a YouTube video. Uh, the guy's named Jefferson Bethke. Uh, he became really popular on YouTube uh, a few years back. He made a video called "Jesus is Greater Than Religion" or "Why Jesus Hates Religion." I'm not sure if I agree fully with his message there, the way he presented it, but definitely I, I know he had this video online where he talked about Christians and tattoos, because he has tattoos, uh, and he walks through a lot of what Jake talked about in the first segment, where it is permissible for Christians to have tattoos uh, under the freedom that we have in Christ. Uh, so just so you get that biblical, really good uh, message uh, that Jefferson Bethke put together. Okay, so Jake, uh, fast forward a little bit. You got back into tattooing. Uh, yeah. How have you been able to share Christ in the tattoo world? Can you share uh, just some of the opportunities and ways you've been able to witness to others through uh, your your job here? Well, yeah, when I first got back into it, because it, it just, people just would kind of be like, hey, I heard you do tattoos. Let me get this tattoo or that tattoo. And like, uh, okay. So, um, we really, really started struggling for mm. money financially. So I'd do a tattoo here and there, but I was really, uh, legalistic about what I did, strangely enough. Mm. Because when I, when I started to come back into it, you know, um, Levit- Leviticus, it was like, oh, well, does that represent the dead? The yeah. tattoo that this person wants. So mm-hmm. I would be like, "Well, sorry, I'm not. I can't do that." You know, that's a zodiac symbol. Mm. Uh, Bible says not to mar- or not to uh, look to the stars for answers. So uh, I'm not going to do that for you. Yeah. And, and instead of and, and that's what how I how I was in the beginning, the first couple of years, and. I've probably missed a lot of opportunity to sit down with that person for however long the tattoo was going to take and tattoo them and talk about it instead mm. of just hitting them with, well, the Bible says not to do that. Yeah, yeah. Because they didn't really understand. So just a, a new Christian who doesn't really understand stuff. So now, nowadays, um, the other day I was tattooing, a uh, guy came in and he had this big giant 666 on his, down his forearm. Oh, wow. And all the other, all the other guys are looking at me like, oh, is he going to do this? You know, like, what's, what's good? Cause if I say anything wrong or something, the, the first ones would be like, that's not very Christian of you. Or like, oh, okay, well, do you want to talk about it? And they're like, no, no, I don't want to talk about it. Anyway. This guy, this guy comes in, he's got the 666 on him. He's like, yeah, man, I want to get, like, more skulls down the arm. I just want them to look really evil and stuff. I was like, all right, cool, yeah, sit down. So I start drawing the skulls on him and stuff. And I says, uh, so what's up with the 666? And he's like, oh, well, I just like it because it scares people. I'm like, oh yeah, and he's like, yeah, and I was, I was raised Jehovah's Witness. And I was like, oh dang, I'm sorry, dude. And he's like, what? And I said, I'm sorry. He huh. said, yeah, you know, I was giving speeches at 12 years old about this stuff, and I had to go door to door my whole life. It's just, you know, so I had a grandma who's who I I've actually talked to. Jehovah's Witness, and she goes around, and, and I have actually talked to her about, you know, hey, maybe she reads the Bible, you know. Mm-hmm. And she's like, well, I do read the Bible. I said, no, you don't. That's not the Bible. Mm. And you guys have created your own version of the Bible. And so I was like, oh, I've, I've actually talked to your grandma. And she's like, oh, really? Said, yeah, I'm telling her about it. Maybe she reads the Bible. So I got an opportunity. I did some skulls on them that he wanted, he would have got somewhere else anyway. Yeah. And I got, you know, a good three hours of talking to him. Wow, yeah. And, and trying to explain, you know, who Jesus is and who God is in the Bible and what the Bible actually says, not what 
the cult says. And I got, you know, you were in a cult, dude, that sucks. I'm sorry. Yeah. So maybe one day he'll come in and be like, hey, can we cover this 666 up, you know? Yeah, and that's something I've seen on Facebook that you post a lot, images of before and afters on uh, cover-ups. I, I didn't even know that that was really possible. The, the stuff you do, to me, is mind-blowing. Uh, can you talk about that, like some of the cover-up jobs you've done, like what you are capable of doing, just in case someone listening knows someone who regrets yeah, yeah. a tattoo or has one they regret themselves and how they can maybe get in contact with you for that? Yeah, um, I cover-ups are pretty challenging, but there's always something you can put over something else. I've covered up um, this one girl had she had been in a gang, and she had like this devil girl on her arm, and she wanted that covered up. And she had recently been saved, and and you know. As non-Christians will say, it was just coincidence that she found me hmm. and had me cover it up, and uh, just all kinds of different different cover-ups. Yeah, it's it just a matter of staring at the at the the tattoo and figuring out what we can put over it and what the person actually wants to put over it. Yeah, uh, send me some of like uh, some of the best images for that that you've done. I'll, I'll put them on the blog post uh, for this episode. It's uh, andyrasman.com, episode 31, and you listeners, you can see all of what he's talking about. It's like truly amazing what he, what he does. I think that alone um, is just a great gift from God for you to be able to help someone like move past uh, something that they've put on their body that they regret or that doesn't glorify God. Uh, hey, could you share... Uh, this one story that you've told with me, I, I thought it was pretty powerful. Uh, the guy that you tattooed that then uh, went out, I, I think it was afterwards you went out to a bar with him and you got to share the gospel with him. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, there was another tattoo artist, and his name was Schmo. And he was tattooed in the Oakland area. Really, really, really cool guy. Really um, spiritual, you know. But, so he's, yeah, I, I don't believe in that, but I'm, I believe in spirit, being spiritual and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. uh, everybody has a mishmash of all the religions, I think. Mm -hmm. what I see. Um, but he was guest spotting with me at a tattoo shop up in Washington, and he was 45 years old. Okay. About, yeah, he's mid-40s, and he, I was looking through his, in, you know, every time you meet somebody now, you're like, hey, you have an Instagram? I'm like, yeah, I have an Instagram. Oh, what is it? So I was looking at his Instagram, and I'm liking his pictures, and I see a pentagram there, and I'm like, oh, man. Mm -hmm. And he's like, what? And I said, oh, it's a pentagram. And he's like, oh, you don't, uh, you don't like Satan worshipers? I said, no, it's not the Satan worshipers I don't like. It's Satan. Yeah. I said, I can't stand them. And he, and he looked at me kind of funny, and we just kind of went back around, but, um, you know through the work day and uh, at the end of the day uh, one of my buddies Jeffy was like hey you want to go up to the brewery and I said yeah I'll go up there with you so me and Jeff and this guy Schmo went up there and uh, we were sitting around the table and on the inside of my my reading or they're not reading glasses but inside of my glasses says uh, John fourteen six. That's engraved on there. Mm. And he says, he's a, oh, that's why you don't like Satan worshippers. I said, I don't, it's not Satan worshippers I don't like, it's Satan. Yeah. And he's like, well, what's that? Huh. So I started talking to him about it and how I've got to share almost my whole, ta whole testimony with him. Wow. And he asked me, well, what about this? And what about that? And what about, you know, so I answered all, all of his questions and, 
the other the other two guys would ask some questions too. And then uh I was like, All right, you know, I gotta get going and uh I left and then I went back to my house and two days later I got a um phone call from one of the guys that was at the table and he says, Hey, uh, just wanna let you know Schmo died the next night. He was in a car with a girl and she drove off the off the uh, cliff and he he got killed. And I immediately was like, Oh no, did I say enough? Like did I explain enough? Did, you know. Yeah. Like so you, you never know when the person you're talking to, that's that's it. Like they have ten minutes left, they have two hours left. Hmm. So ever ever since then I was Try to be a little bit more diligent without being pushy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You don't you don't want to push them, and it's like the little tiny things that you don't even think make sense to you, or but they click with that person. Yeah, but the Holy Spirit's talking to them. I mean, I I find it so encouraging though that you got to share your whole testimony with him, starting from the fact that you're simply here in the tattoo world. You see the pentagrams that he's done or has done or has on himself, and then. you know, I I mean, there's, there's like you said, did you say enough was I'm sure if you shared your testimony, you got to share that Jesus paid for all your sins, that it's about what he has done for you and not you trying to earn his approval. And, you know, I would hope like going over the edge there that, you know, that word was still there in him. And he could have been like, oh, yeah, you know, like that, that even that last moment could have been clinging to faith in the words that you told him. Uh, yeah, yeah so, I hope so. Yeah, I, I definitely hope so. Uh, Jake, uh, I, I mentioned that at the start of segment one that you also are involved in remote control helicopters. I know most people call those drones, and you don't like yeah. calling them drones. Uh, no, I there's two words that I like. It's religion and drone. <laughs> I like how you explain religion with the reconnect. I really do like that, but the, I don't like the the vast... Oh, uh, everybody, oh, you're religious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's, it comes uh, with a lot of baggage yeah. when people hear that. Um, yeah, yeah, everybody has their own definition of stuff. Yeah. It, it really reminds me of OCD mm-hmm. and my struggle against that, I guess, is, you know, doing something to try to please God you, over and over and over again just makes God look like the fool that, oh, I want my people just to kneel down and pray exactly at this time of day or I'm not going to talk to him anymore. You yeah, know? yeah, that's, 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 that's not that's how God operates. That's to me is. Yeah. Like your that's kids a, that you drone. mentioned, you love them from birth. <laughs> you, they didn't have to do anything. Yeah, yeah. You, you're always been messed up. Let, let me help you out. Yeah. Um, but the drone word was kind of uh, thrown on us by the media to mm. scare people. And I was in the Navy for 10 years, and I've seen real drones, and I've met real drone pilots, and I would never bring one of my quadcopters to them and be like, yeah, I fly drones too. <laughs> I just feel kind of silly. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, they call them drones, and we race them, and we put cameras on them and try to capture beautiful things, and uh, there's always somebody that, trying to fly one in the wrong place or people are really worried about their privacy when you have something with four spinning blades outside your window, you're going to know it's there rather than a guy with a GoPro taped to a stick who you're not going to hear him. Uh You can get just as much footage, you know, in through your window as that person. So I don't really think that the privacy is a big deal, but everybody gets kind of, uppity about that stuff so we tried to fight the drone word for a long time but it's pretty much just a lost cause yeah so i, I know that uh i thought this was cool just to talk about because through your involvement with flying these remote control helicopters you you've kind of made a name for yourself from what i'm seeing because you've had people come and make documentaries about your work you've had stuff online and th- these are people that are not christians and i just looking up some stuff that they've put online about you one person referred to you as the first RC Christian minister, so the first remote control Christian minister. 
And another person even wrote the article, and it was for Vice, uh, one of their channels called Motherboard, uh, born again Christian who flies a drone for God. So, so clearly, what what you're doing with this is making an impact, and people are connecting it uh, to Christ. Uh, so, do you mind speaking a little bit on the ministry you created uh, with yeah, remote control stuff? So, I, I just think people can maybe get some ideas for just their their own hobbies that maybe they just write off as a hobby, but something that they could actually share with the world somehow and then also share Christ through doing such. Yeah. Um, well, like I said before, I, I just stopped doing anything and everything that, that for me and from what I was reading for the Bible, I'd give everything up. Yeah. And I'd done RC for a really long time. And everything that I was, I was trying to, work in ministry somehow, you know, make a living talking about God, you know, so that you're not led astray. And that's, you know, that's my idea, but it didn't really work out. Mm-hmm. Flesh, flesh pilot came out of that because um, with my original question to God was, you know, why does this place suck and why is all these people hurting? Uh, I had no idea that Satan was real and he was the one doing all this stuff to people. Mm-hmm. And in... In Romans eight twenty four, you know, our promise that the Lord's going to come back. Yeah. And that's where our hope comes from, and we receive new body. And I was like, oh, yeah, because, you know, the things we're made out of are atoms. Yeah. Our bodies are made out of atoms, and those things don't really have to die. And we just, you know, seven years ago, um, we had a whole different set of atoms, and and so we have a whole new body from what we had seven years ago. Mm. And I was well, yeah, I totally can get that I'm not the guy I see in the mirror. I'm my soul is who I am, you know. My yeah. yeah. I'm not this body. Uh huh. So the person that the little girl that's looking at herself in the mirror and saying, I'm ugly. I, you know, they told me I'm ugly. That's not you, you know. Um, but whoever, you know, the vanity part where, oh, I'm so beautiful, you know, kind of like what Satan did. I'm so beautiful and I'm so smart. That's not you, you know? Yeah. That beauty is going to go away. Yeah, yeah. And so when I was flying, I was watching a channel one day on YouTube and it was called Flight Test. Okay. And, um... One of the guys on there, they're both named Josh, right? Well, I looked and I saw on his arm a scripture. It wasn't really a scripture. It was more like lyrics, but it said Jesus on his, tattooed on his arm. Uh-huh. And I was like, whoa, okay. So, um, I started listening more and more, and... Uh, the other guy, Josh, turns out this, this guy with the Jesus tattoo, he's a, uh, uh, music, mm-hmm. pastor. I don't know what the heck. I can't. Worship pastor, maybe? Right now. Yeah. yeah, he's a worship pastor. And then the other, the other guy, Josh, he's, you know, uh, really, um, he's a Christian too. So, I saw through them that they're flying these, these planes, FPV and stuff like that. I was like, man, that's really cool. I want to do that, but mm. I, you know, I probably shouldn't spend the money to do that and I shouldn't. So I just kind of started buying like, I built my first quadcopter for a hundred bucks and I spaced it out over like three months wow. buying parts and just having them show up at the door. And finally I put this thing together. I was like, man, this is really how you could kind of understand that you're in a different body or you can be in a different body so easily. Yeah. How so? Well, when you're looking through the camera, you have goggles on and you're controlling that little body, that that plane or or a quadcopter. Yeah. And you're seeing everything and you're being able to control it, but you're not really in there. Gotcha. So... That's where Flesh Pilot came from, was trying to get people to understand that when Jesus returns, he's going to give us new bodies. 
Mm. Ones that don't die, don't get sick, don't get sad, don't cry, don't, you know, all that. And that's where that came from. Nice. Really cool. And then, uh, I, I believe you've even put your designs online, right? So people that maybe, uh, can't afford to buy one can make one themselves for a lot cheaper. Is that correct? Yeah, I made, um, I've made some plans to where people can just get some Dollar Tree foam board. Uh huh. And, uh, you know, like poster board, but it's foam board and print out the plans for free and then they cut them out and then hot glue them together and then they have to buy the motors and stuff like that. But it, well, that's um, great. They could put together their own. Yeah, it's really cool. Yeah. And then, uh, I, I found it really impressive. I don't know how many times you've done this, but you've, you've, done this at least once I that you've told me about where you've gone to like a church and you put on like a camp where you teach kids how to make these and then you go through your testimony and share the whole idea behind Flesh Pilot. Um, is that is that something yeah. you've done a lot or is that something you want to do more of? That's what I want to do more of um, was like teaching kids, okay, yeah, we got to sit here and wait for Jesus to come back. And nobody knows when he's coming back except for the Father. So, but we can't just sit on top of a hill and stare at the clouds and wait for them. Uh-huh. So kids need skills, and soldering is a skill, GPS is a skill, you know, all these different skills that you have to know to even build one of these things mm-hmm. or put them together. So I, I wanted to be able to teach kids that and also teach, you know, scripture that goes along with each thing that they're doing and, and show them, like, uh, like when the, the, my friends, they're my friends now, they came out to do the documentary on me. Um, the first, very first day I'm flying, I crashed into the water mm. and destroyed the whole helicopter. And I got to share with them. It's like, that's life. That's, that's how our lives are. Like, yeah. You got to pick up the pieces, but you have somebody to help you pick up the pieces. Now Jesus is there to help you pick up. The pieces. Mm. It's not going to be perfect and it's not going to be rosy in fact the the ruler of this world Jesus became an enemy of him by proclaiming you love Jesus yeah so your life is actually going to be harder in a way uh-huh. but you have Jesus to help you and so uh, we got to share that with them and, you know yeah this this little body a little quadcopter that crashed in the water the little body's broken but look we can fix it now. And that's what our hope is for, is when Jesus comes back, that we get a new body, one that doesn't glitch, doesn't break, doesn't crash, doesn't... You know, yeah, it's, that's, that's such... Satan's gone. That's such a good object lesson. Is gone. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, that's that's amazing. How how do those documentary people receive receive that message? Were they just kind of, oh, okay, or... I They're mean, both I'm just Jewish. Curious. Okay. They're both from Israel... And they received it really well, um, but they're in the professional world, mm-hmm. you know. And you make a, you make a, you know, you proclaim Christ in the professional world, you can become kind of an outcast, right? By that. So I don't know if it, you know, it's, especially today's day and age, you don't you don't want to offend whoever you're working for, you know, whoever's gay or straight or. Christian or yeah. Muslim or whatever, so I think they have to walk a narrow, yeah, definitely narrow line on the wide, the wide, uh, the wide path. Right, <laughs> but like you said, you still got relationship with them. You're friends with them now, uh, and yeah. you're still communicating with them. So I, I just think it's great how they found you online by what you were creating. They made a documentary. You've been able to share Christ with them. You even get to share Christ in the documentary, which is really amazing. So uh, the documentary was called Lessons on Leaving Your Body. At least that's what I found online, I believe. That's called Reality Capture. I don't know which name it is, but um, really, really powerful stuff. Uh, So, listeners, I'm going to put links to the uh, Vice Motherboard article called The Born Again Christian Who Flies a Drone for God. That uh, has links to... uh, Flesh Pilot in it, it, as well as to Jake's testimony. It has some video clips of him flying his drones and letting you see what he actually sees. Because 
Uh, I don't know if Jake really explained it here, but this is he has goggles on, and this is what he's flying. What he actually sees, basically, it, it feels like he's flying, and it almost is like an out of body experience because what he sees is what is uh, the camera sees in the in in the helicopter. So really powerful stuff. Uh, so definitely go to episode thirty one at andyrasman dot com. You'll see tons of links to. Jake's works, pictures of his tattoos, all sorts of things. Uh, Jake, closing question here, something to leave listeners with. Uh, what advice do you have for them? Uh, you've been able to use tattooing. Obviously, that's a job, and you can even make money through the helicopter flying by making helicopters and selling them and whatnot. But uh, for the most part, this can just be like people's hobbies, like art or making remote control stuff and working on it. Uh, ro- robotics can be a hobby. Uh, people have many different hobbies. What advice would you have Christians who have a hobby, but they go, you know, maybe I'm not using this in some way, uh, as a vehicle to share Christ. What advice do you have of them to think of their hobbies and then take that next step of sharing that hobby with others in a way that they can share Christ? Well, it, what really hit me was where the Bible says, and everything you do, do it for the Lord. So, no matter what you do, do it for the glory of God. And, um, so, whatever I do, is before I go and do it, I have to make sure, or not make sure, but I think about it. Like, is this something that you want me to do, Lord? Mm-hmm. Or is this something that I, want, I just want to do? So, you know, in prayer, and then, um, obviously, you know, you're not going to go, if your hobby's professional beer drinker, you, you, you might want to think that one through. Yeah. You know, in competition beer drinking, I, I don't know how you're going to share the, I'm sure the Lord can do it, because he could turn, you know, water into wine. True. He's real good at making our bad situations into good ones. Yeah. But everything you do... Just try to bring Jesus into it, mm-hmm. and you know, and that that in, in itself is a struggle. When you feel yourself not wanting to talk about the Lord, that's when you're supposed to. Yeah, absolutely. But I really don't feel like I'm supposed to talk about Jesus right now, but I bet you that I'm supposed to. And that's when amazing things happen. You see, really uh, miraculous things happen. You know. It's, Wow. Yeah. Good thing I talked about you there, you know? Yeah. There's, good there's, thing I brought that up. Definitely. There's, there's power in the words of Christ and in his name. Um, and probably, yeah. probably that's where we're weakest is when we don't bring that into uh, our conversations. Because that, that truly is where life is and where life comes from. So. Yeah, it doesn't really matter what you're doing as long as you know that the person you're talking to or the person that's listening you know for a fact that God loves them. Yeah. And whether they know the Lord or they don't, God wants them saved. Mm-hmm. He doesn't want to lose anybody. So it makes it a little easier to, uh, you know what, I want to talk about you. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. Really cool. Well, Jake, thanks for taking the time away from your family and sitting in your car to talk with me right now. And uh, I sure. just it's just my prayer, listeners, that you know, uh, you can be inspired by Jake, just like I've been, just to be more bold in my faith. He definitely is not shy of speaking God's word. And maybe just to close then, to connect this to John fourteen six, which Jake has shared, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Uh, linking on that thing about truth, wherever there is truth in the world, there Christ is. And as Jake said, uh, when we see that truth, let's connect it to Christ, let's share it, and it's through that that people are reconnected into a right relationship with the Lord. Uh, so God bless you and uh, the many ways that He has gifted you uh, to be His servant. Thanks. All right, peace, Jake. God bless you. God bless you. Your mission, if you choose to accept it, 
Share this episode on all of your social media sites and with your email contacts, people who will benefit from listening to the show. Thank you for listening. Reconnect us, O oh Lord.